Well, good evening. Uh, thank you uh, to, uh, to our vicar, Rick Hornblow, for the kind invitation to join with you uh, this afternoon. It's my hope that throughout a process of sharing together tonight, that we'll be able to better arrive at an understanding of the really important topic that I've been asked to speak about. I must say that after a season of trying to support the aptly named Auckland Blues rugby team, I feel particularly well equipped to talk about depression. <laughs> Fortunately, my, my faith has been somewhat restored when I reflected on the words of the Apostle Paul, when he said in Corinthians, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is only temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. <coughs> that applies equally to rugby teams as it does to us today. And I thought it was really appropriate to again bring that reading to you, because it is a reading that signals hope in a world where often we see despair. I thought just for a moment, I wonder if you'd just like to just have a bit of a glance at the person to the right of you, and a bit of a glance at the person to the left of you, have a bit of a glance behind you and in front of you, not to be too embarrassing, say hello if you want to. <laughs> it's another chance to make yourself known to some people around you. A little bit of information that you might find helpful, and it may surprise you, but you know, it's widely acknowledged that one in every ten people will at some stage in their life experience some form of mental illness. Now, I'm not suggesting that you or the people around you are one in ten, but it gives you an indication of how relevant and how complex and how frequently people are affected in this way. Trust me, people who suffer from mental illness and particularly depression, which is what I'd like to focus on tonight, are not unique. They share company with famous people. People like Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, Richard Nixon, Napoleon Bonaparte, Hans Christian Anderson, Graham Greene, Ernest Hemingway, Irving Berlin, T.S. Eliot, Victor Hugo, Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, Robbie Lewis Stevenson, Leo Tolstoy, Tennessee Williams, Cole Porter, Kurt Cobain, for those Nirvana fans here tonight, Vincent Van Gogh, Michelangelo, and some of my favourite comedians, including John Cleese, who I know has loved and thought well of in this community. <laughs> I was told the story when I arrived. Spike Milligan, Stephen Fry, famous people. <laughs> Virginia Woolf. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? So many people, so well known, so creative, that have experienced some form of mental illness in their life. In many cases, depression. In many cases, at their most creative, when they were in the throes of being depressed or elated. What I hope that you will be able to take out of this evening is a message of hope. A message that says just because you or someone you know has experienced some form of mental illness, life as we know it does not need to come to a grinding halt. So let's stop just for a moment, because I've mentioned rugby. Let's think about the new Auckland coach. The Like Minds, Like Mind campaign. What some of us often refer to as the John Curlin television adverts. This campaign seeks to do some really important things. To demystify mental illness, and in particular, depression. But it also helps us to understand that there's hope in the midst of what some people experience as despair. It conveys a key message. Know me before you judge me. Know me before you judge me. A challenge to understand our fellow man. 
to care and to respond. There is a website, www.depression.org.nz, for those internet aficionados amongst you. And that's where a lot of really good, relevant information can be obtained. So if you are on the internet, I encourage you to have a look at that site. It contains some wonderful hints and, and aids to help us work through not only our own feelings, but the feelings of those that we are living alongside. You know, most people feel miserable sometime or another. Often they feel miserable when something really stressful is happening in their lives. A relationship breakup, or losing a job, or something of that nature. How many of us have often heard or said something like, I just can't seem to lose weight? Or how the heck did I not get that promotion? Or, I just feel so absolutely hopeless. Kerwin says on his website, feeling down in response to difficult situations is really pretty normal. It's pretty normal. And the feelings fade over time and you get on with life. But when the feelings of unhappiness are persistent and intense, when they don't go away, when things don't improve, then that could be depression. So how about that expression that we're all familiar with? Why don't you just pull yourself together? Trust me, that's not particularly good advice to give someone that's in the throes of feeling really down and depressed. Because they're incapable of pulling themselves together. Let's appreciate one important thing. People who are depressed cannot often address those issues without proper treatment, with antidepressants, or psychotherapy, or some form of therapeutic or counselling support, untreated clinical depression can last for weeks, months, and even years. The positive news, however, is that with the right and appropriate intervention and treatment, most people with depression can be helped in a very positive way. Here again are some really important and sobering facts you might like to consider. Approximately one in seven young people in New Zealand will experience a major depressive episode in their lives before the age of 24. Women will have higher rates of depression than men. One in five women, compared with one in eight men, will have some form of depression experience in their lifetime. Depression is one of the commonest reasons that people are absent from work or find struggles with daily life. The World Health Organization tells us that by the year 2020, depression will be the second most common cause of ill health and premature death worldwide. In fact, it's estimated by the year 2020, major depression will be second only to ischemic heart disease in terms of the leading cause of disability across the world. We need to know that depression is the most common risk factor for suicidal behaviour. It's estimated that depression increases the risk of suicide 20 times. One definition of depression that I particularly like is the one that calls it the common cold of mental illness. It certainly is far more common than many of us would care to appreciate. But what really is it? It's certainly more than just a low mood that many of us experience from time to time. It can, in fact, be a really serious condition. And when this occurs, the term that medical people use for it is a major depressive disorder. So I guess we need to ask ourselves, what constitutes serious? Well, it's serious if it lasts for more than two weeks and where the person feels miserable, utterly miserable most of the day, every day. But depression can also alter in terms of severity and it does affect people differently. For example, people with severe depression often find it really hard to cope with day-to-day -day life. On the other hand, milder forms of depression may simply reduce an individual's enjoyment of life, their ability to enjoy the things that otherwise they might, not, they might normally enjoy. 
The important thing to remember is that without appropriate support, the condition will become serious. It will exacerbate. It's also important to remember that all types of depression are not the same. And I guess we're familiar with some of them. We call chronic depression, that unremitting, ongoing dysthymia, we call it in medical circles. Medical people have this wonderful propensity to come up with big long words that are difficult to pronounce and even more difficult to remember. But dysthymia affects millions of people worldwide. It's an ongoing feeling of sadness that people live with on a daily basis. You will have heard of postpartum depression, often affecting women following childbirth. And most of us will have heard of bipolar depression, what we used to call manic depressive illness. We now find much more socially acceptable ways to describe some of these things, so we now call it bipolar affective disorder. It's where people move, where their mood states move from simply being a little sad to being profoundly depressed. And then they can move through into another phase where they become exceedingly elated. And people can oscillate between those states, or those poles as we call them, depending on what's happening on a day by day and sometimes an hour by hour basis. Seasonal depression is probably the one that we're most familiar with. Strangely enough, it's referred to as SAD, Seasonal Affective Depression. And this is often when you look out the window and it's raining, and you really feel you don't want to get out of bed. Well, thought like that? I do not want to go to work today. I hope my staff don't say that about me at the Anglican Trust. But, you know, it's where you get up and you think, I just haven't got the energy for the get up and go to get up and go. It happens often during certain times of the year. Often happens during winter. And then at the far end of the spectrum, over here, I guess, if we think mild anxiety and feelings of sadness are here, over this side, we've, we've got what we call psychotic depression. A really severe state, characterised by thoughts and, and perceptions that the rest of the people around you aren't sharing, don't understand false beliefs, hearing voices, those sorts of things can often be symptomatic of a serious mental condition characterised by depression. So what do the scriptures say about it? Well, one thing they tell us is depression is certainly not a new phenomenon. The Bible uses words such as downcast, sad, forlorn, discouraged, downhearted, mourning, troubled, miserable, despairing and broken-hearted, and it uses them with some degree of regularity. In fact, as one commentator said, it's quite likely the first humans to experience real depression were Adam and Eve after they sinned against God. But other notable examples, if we go and look at the scriptures, include Saul. Saul was very depressed and stressed, unable to live up to certain expectations made of him. His own armour-bearer, who wanted to die alongside him. Judas, who felt trapped by materialism and guilt. Naomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth. King Solomon. Hannah, who was barren, couldn't have children. Jeremiah, who we often refer to or hear referred to as the weeping prophet. All of these experienced some form of mental illness and in the main some form of depression. We even read that Elijah came to a broom bush, sat under it, and prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And if you look and read through the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament prophets were a pretty miserable lot. They experienced feelings of real sadness. Think about Job for a moment and the trials of Job. If you really want to feel depressed, read the book of Job a few times. But also remember that in the book of Job there is a, an enormous sense of hope and a strong sense of his faith that saw him through those trials. An author who I like, John Brechtel, an American author, wrote once, in the middle of agony and pain, it's hard to see things clearly. 
It may even be difficult to see God's love. And when I think about Job, a man who went through difficult times, lost his family, virtually everything he owned, he went through sickness. It's really important to understand exactly what he later understood. That no matter what you feel, no matter what happens, God does exist and he deeply loves you. No matter how awful things become, no matter what happens, we can never be separated from the love of God. But even Christians can let us down, so let's not be too clever about this. Some of the most critical and difficult times we can be let down by people who we think should be the people that will stand alongside us. In fact, Jesus learned the hard way, didn't he? When he was arrested for no crime at all, where were his friends? They ran away. He was about to be killed on the cross and his disciples, his closest friends and confidence, ran away. They left him at his darkest hour. When Christians fail you, however, it's really, really important to remember that God does not forget you. He has a plan for all of us. So even in the middle of heartbreak, tell God, I am going to hold on and wait for you to show me your kindness and your love, no matter what happens. So the question, I guess, becomes, how do we know if we are depressed and how do we know how to deal with it when it begins to affect either ourselves or someone around us? There is a wonderful book called the DSM-4. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And psychiatrists refer to it as their Bible. It's a great, great big heavy book. I suggest you never try to read it. It's very good for stopping doors closed on a windy night. <laughs> However, it contains all the ways in which you can diagnose different forms of mental illness. So it says in the DSM-4 that depression occurs when you experience at least five of the following things. I found the DSM-4 a difficult book to read because I, I learned it when I was, as part of my studies originally, um, when I was training in psychiatry. And I was talking with, um, with our reverend uh, earlier today, and I said it was frightening because it's like psychologists when they're doing, when they're students studying a psychology degree. You start to read things and you start to think, I've got that. <laughs> oh yes, I felt like that. <laughs> How well am I really? And they're the questions you begin to ask yourself. And I read the DSM-4 and I figured that by the time I got from one end to the other that I suffered from about seven or eight different disorders. <laughs> None of which were treatable. It's very, very reassuring, let me tell you. But what it does say is that if we experience more than five of these things at the same time, then it's pretty likely that we've got a depression happening for us. The first thing is a depressed mood. So we feel depressed most of the day, often in the mornings. It's worse. We feel fatigued or loss of energy. We have feelings of worthlessness or guilt or a sense of hopelessness almost every day. Our concentration is improved, is, is impaired. We're indecisive. We have difficulty concentrating and remembering. We have difficulty in dealing with the day-to-day -day decision making. And then there's insomnia, an inability to sleep, waking up early in the morning and being preoccupied and our thoughts running through and through our heads and just not able to go away. Or hypersomnia, which is excessive sleeping. In other words, going to sleep and, and just sleeping and sleeping and sleeping all day. And finally, a marked diminished interest or pleasure in almost all the activities in which we would normally take pleasure. So those sorts of things are the things that often we look for. But we don't look for one on its own. Because on its own, waking up early in the morning and being preoccupied, as I did this morning, waking up and thinking, oh gosh, I've got to go and do this really stressful thing tonight, I'm feeling anxious, what, what do I do, how do I... That's, that's actually not depression. It's a horrible sense of realism. <laughs> but you know, so on its own, it may not be. 
um, symptomatic of anything more serious. However, if it is unremitting, if it is day by day, then it's time to look at getting some help. And the other symptom we look for is significant loss of weight or weight gain. So suddenly, if for no, no explicable reason you suddenly start to put on weight or lose weight, combined with those other symptoms, then sometimes that can be suggestive that you may have a depressive illness. But because people with depression don't all experience the same symptoms, how severe these symptoms are, how frequent, and how long they last, do vary from person to person. So having recognised what it might be, how do we deal with it? One of the prevalent theories of the causation of depression is that it may be caused by chemical imbalances in our brain. We have things called neurotransmitters that send messages across various parts of our brain. And because those certain neurotransmitters, specifically two that we call serotonin and norepinephrine, influence mood and pain, then it's not uncommon for people experiencing depression to also experience physical symptoms. Not just about mood, but about pain. These symptoms might include joint pain, or back pain, or gastrointestinal problems, or stomach upsets, sleep disturbances, appetite changes. And it's not unusual for people to go to their GP complaining about the physiological symptoms and getting the depression overlooked or missed. So it's really important that when these things are unremitted, when they're day on day, night on night, that you go and you make those things really clear to your medical practitioner. If it is a reason, if depression is a reason, then antidepressant medication may certainly be part of the answer. I read somewhere that God said he's allowed mankind to learn about medical tools and he sometimes uses medicine to heal. It's also, however, important to acknowledge that some cases of depression are so severe that medication is necessary, if only to enable the individual to get to the point where they feel that they're strong enough and well enough to be able to deal with the underlying causes or the underlying issues. As skilled medical practitioners will tell you, medication should be used with caution. It's not simply a matter of popping a pill and feeling better. Because it may be that all you're doing is popping a pill and feeling better. You're not dealing with or addressing the underlying issues. A combination of medication and other strategies often is the best way to produce a positive outcome. One of the additional strategies we can use has come out of the school of what we call cognitive behavioural therapy. Uh, or sometimes you hear the term CBT. One of the cognitive therapists, Aaron Beck, talks about a triad of forces that contribute... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that contribute to the onset of depression. And that these forces originate in our thinking. He describes them as constant negative thoughts about our person, who we are, about the situation we're in, and about the, about the future that we face. He argues that these things contribute to symptoms of feeling defeated, or defective, or deserted, or deprived. And so cognitive behavioural therapy offers an opportunity to explore those feelings and for addressing them in such a way that relieves the depression which the person is experiencing. The good news is that with early recognition, with intervention, with support and with appropriate treatment, more than 80% of people experiencing clinical depression can be successfully treated. Over 80%. I've talked to lots of groups about mental health and about mental illness and about depression, I guess, over the years, mostly in smaller groups. This is probably one of the largest congregations I've spoken to. But one thing I'd like to leave you with tonight is that there is hope. It is not the end of the world if you begin, or someone you know begins to experience some form of mental illness. We need to demystify it. 
We need to, need to do what John Kerman does in those advertisements on TV. We need to bring people to a level of clarity and understanding. If we get the flu, or if we have, as we were talking about last night, high cholesterol, then we take a pill. And if we continue to take that medication, we continue to keep well, we continue to keep our blood serum levels within a normal range. And that reduces the possibility of the incidence of heart disease or uh, hypertension or any of those number of things which can eventually carry soft in the urinary gland. There is no difference with someone who has an ongoing mental illness. Often, these are people who may need to take medication for a long period of time. But they are people who continue to function and to live normal lives, and in many cases, each of us will never know about it if they didn't tell us. So let's take some of the mystery out of it. Let's restore some hope for ourselves and our communities. A few weeks ago, I spoke at the All Saints Church, coming up another All Saints Church in Halifax. And the collect that day on Social Services Sunday, I thought it was a wonderful way to perhaps conclude tonight. So I'd like to read it to you. Compassionate God, you meet us in our brokenness, in our pain, calling us to growth and healing. Help us to experience your love so deeply and to see the need in our community so clearly that with open hearts and creative minds, we may join you in making people and communities whole. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who brings reconciliation, healing, and release. Amen.